Okay, uh, I'm cold, so I'm going to be moving around a little bit and finding, hopefully, a, a ideal spacing that it's not too loud. If you can't hear me, raise your hand. If it's too loud, throw something at me. You'll get my attention. Uh, I, I want to know a little bit about you guys, so show your hands. Uh, mechanical engineers. Great. EEs. Software. Maybe in the wrong room. No, joking. Uh, material scientist. General technologist. Great. Okay. So this is going to be cool. I admit uh, half hour is going to be tight. Usually there's interesting questions, which I love. So we'll try things that are interesting. I'll spend a little bit more time. Things that are a little trivial since we have a good group of engineers, because a lot of times I do this in front of different groups. Um, questions, if they're really cool and you think they're cool, raise your hand. We'll try to balance it out so it's interesting and not just me talking for a half hour. At the end, I do have really cool samples if you want to see. I know the Uber is after me, which is a very cool presentation. I've seen some of their presentations. Uh, so we, I'll stay here after lunch or things like that. Come talk to me if you want. Okay, some of the things we'll talk about, general additive, uh, a little bit of background about nano. We'll skip that because it's not really why we're here. Uh, PCB RF designs, uh, where we'll spend some time, non-planar, electromechanical, and some future stuff. The theme for my presentation is this phrase, uh, right? If we reject the change because we have not done it before, then it's wrong. We have a jar at Nano if we have an idea, and we reject it because we haven't done it or we've done something else that way before. Somebody needs to put $10 in a jar. There's a significant amount of money there. Why additive, right? So things. Um, some of us that work at big companies, and I used to work in defense, so big companies is an understatement, right? Just to get a quote out, just to get the process going of a prototype is awful. We had in our company a actual team goal to get it right, two revisions. And now that I think about it, that's, pardon my French, idiotic, right? We want to do 10 because we want to make sure it's perfect. We want to try as many components as we can, we want to reduce the bomb cost, we want to experiment, we want to play with, we want to add features, reduce features, right? We want the time that we don't have, but we want to play with as many options as we can. So definitely speed, IP, right? Once you send something out, it's out. I don't care what the NDA says, you've sent files out. And especially when they start coming back with questions, right? So we all have secure servers to transfer, but then they have questions, hey, this via is not right, and you start with screenshots and emails, then it's all gone, right? So uh, protecting the IP is important. Um, we always talk about the uh, prototypes that we've done. Nobody talks about the prototypes they haven't done. I had an idea, I thought it's a good idea, but we're in crunch time, no time, Boss is busy. Nobody can give me an okay to build this prototype. I forgot about it. I moved on. This was never tested. Could have been a great idea. Could have been a patent. Could have been something. We just didn't have time. Moved on. It's lost. So those are the key things that we're going to talk about and why you should be involved in additive in whatever company you're doing, whatever company you're working for, anything. Narrowing it down, the two main things that take away from this presentation is risk management and time. So this is what I used to do, right? I used to get board one tested out or get prototype one. We've had all these changes we want to do, right? So we cram 20 changes, right? The clock's not right. The, the impedance didn't go right, right? All the things we want to change and change and change and re-spin. Instead, what we should do, let's build a power supply. Let's get 99, 95, 96% efficiency out of our power supply. Let's do logic. Let's do CPUs. Let's do GPIOs, right? Let's test everything individually. It's perfect, then let's combine them, right? Let's understand that our Lego pieces are perfect, and then when they're good and you combine them, it's much easier to get them to work. 
Things of additive can be trivial. This uh, little piece comes from the Air Force. Uh, this is part of a, the, swing the internal swing arm that pushes the big swing arm that catapults airplanes. This is a way that they measure the force that the main catapult sustains, and when this counts enough force, enough runs, they know it needs to be serviced before it breaks down. This takes 20 minutes of design, uh, another probably two, three days they tested it, and now the last version, which we can't show, has it built in to the uh, swing arm. Ideas come from anywhere. In terms of where we are, so anybody here doesn't have a 3D printer in their place of work for mechanical engineers? Right? It's so simple. They design a little widget, they have it tomorrow. Anybody here has a 3D printer of some sort to do electronics? Right? Nobody has it. Right? You guys have it. What do you guys have? I don't know model, but we have it in our staff. Very cool. One. Right? So this is how rare this is. Part of it is education. Part of it is it doesn't fit all applications. We'll touch about all of these. But where we are now, we're definitely in early adopters uh, in the spectrum. If you work for a major you know, consumer electronics company, if you work for major defense, major aerospace, uh, major government lab, you probably have one. Rest, you don't. And some of those big companies, even though they have the tools, they keep them locked down that only select few know where it is, know how to use it, and, and it's kept secret. Who is it for? Right, so it's for everyone. If you, the only barrier is currently the cost to enter this field, right? Currently, the tools, the machines are expensive in the six figure range, right? Big companies are the only ones that can get it. Okay, let's talk a little bit about stories aside, right? Let's talk about how this actually gets done. I'm going to split the conversation of what Nano does, and I also want to talk about other companies to get you the full, full spectrum of what additive for electronics. So we're in the factory in a box, right? Click a button, let the device do its thing, walk away, don't touch it, right? That's what we do. We are in the, there's three ways to do currently electronics. There's, there's, um, kind of like an FDM printer, right? There's materials coming out of a nozzle, and it lays them down. That's one way. There's aerosol jetting, and we are ink jetting, right? Those are the only three ways currently in existence that can achieve something printed in the electronics realm. So we are ink jetting, right? We have two materials. They're liquid form. One of them is a photopolymer. The other one is actual silver, and the silver molecules are suspended in salts. And because we don't have any material scientists, that phrase is going to be sufficient. Usually when I say that and there's a material scientist in the crowd, there's 25 minutes of questions, which I love, but I'm not into the chemistry that much. So we deposit the materials out of two uh, print heads. You can see them one and two. They're right next to each other. They jet at the same time because the particles are so small. Particle size is about nine nanometers. There's 500 nozzles on each edge, individually controlled, right? From one nozzle to 1,000, we can jet at the same time. Three different energies are used to change the state from liquid to solid. You can see there's a UV light and there's an IR light. That's it. The, the bed is also heated, right? That's the third one. So essentially, heat and light, those are the two energies that are used. It's a nonviolent process, right? This is office-friendly. It's not even in a vacuum doesn't need any type of environmental conditions. Rinse and repeat, layer thickness is extremely small. I believe I have that, I don't have it. Okay, uh, layer thickness is about 35, um, 0.35 micron thick. That's a layer that we deposit, right? So extremely thin and rinse and repeat, right? 20, 20, 30,000 times and you get your part done. A little bit about the materials, um, design rules, a little bit over there, right? So these are the extreme safe 
uh, electrical characteristics that you can do in a PCB, and these are considered a no-brainer, right? If you do this, if you maintain those, likelihood of a successful print is very high. If you ignore these, uh, the system is not going to tell you, eh, eh, can't do it, it's going to try, but reliability or uh, usability might not come to play. I want to explain a little bit what that means, right? So here are examples of uh, printed material under the microscope, right? Obviously the first two under microscope, this is not. In order to achieve these perfect lines and perfect spacing, we have to make sure that we deposit material where it's needed and not deposit material where it's not needed. If we violate any of those rules, these lines don't become perfect. And why we suggested these, because we don't know what that line you're trying to print is going to transmit, right? If this is a high-speed signal, analog, DC, right? We don't know, but we have to assume everything you do is critical. And so if something happens to the print and it's not perfect and you maintain those design rules, that's not gonna break the design rules, right? The signal integrity that your line needs, right? Even high speed, we've tested, even at the worst printing conditions, this maintains uh, good connectivity and impedance to transmit your lines or signals. Sorry. When we break those rules, the probability of success reduces, and so we're not in the insurance game, we're here to tell you, click a button, walk away, right? So that's where these came. The dielectric ink, uh, very similarly, uh, it's got excellent performance, somewhere between, so it's a better performance than FR4, slightly less performance than uh, Rogers, definitely not in the Meg 6 range yet, uh, but we're working on it. So, uh, really anything you want to do with it, uh, you could do with it. Extreme, uh, so we, I've already... I did this presentation about a month ago, things already changed, so we've tested with some medical company. So you can see it's 500 volts there, we've actually tested 1500 volts there, uh, and, and so new, the new presentation I have says 1500, right? That's how fast things change. Everything we try to do, we try to make it that you don't need to be an expert, right? You don't need to be a TTM employee, you don't need to have ever made a PCB, Click a button, walk away, right? This will build everything. No secondary process. There's no second machine, no washing, no etching, no drilling, nothing. Even the, the filled vias, everything is printed. Once it's done printing, go assemble it. So. I always like to use this picture. This is definitely a non-perfect print, right? If I showed you perfect prints before of a via, this is a non-perfect print. You can see there's some spray. Even with this spray, the mass of the spray versus the mass of the via is about 100 to 1 ratio, right? 99.9% .9 of the material goes where it needs. 0.1% of the material doesn't go or didn't go where it needed. And so we have these sprays. The difference in contrast is just how close to the surface it is, right? So for instance, this dot that might look bigger, it actually isn't, it's just closer to the surface, so the microscope picked, the microscope picked it up better. But anyway, this still passed a 20 gigahertz signal. And so every type of via you want, any type of design you want, right, we, we don't care. There's no laser drilling. I don't care if the via is blind buried, don't care, really don't care. No penalty, doesn't take longer, doesn't take shorter, we don't care. And to inspect everything you print, right, conventional, conventional tools would do. Stack up. So two ways, so I used to pick the supplier before we did the board and then call the supplier and say, hey, can you help me with the stack up? What are the thicknesses? How can I do this and that? And, you know, I would get back a response. If I deviated from the response and I used that supplier, the board's not going to work because <laughs> that's their material. That's what they need to do. So now if you wanted to, you can take all those rules and throw them out the window because the thicknesses are now whatever you want. There's no sheets of material here. If you want X thickness, 
this is what the thickness will be. If you want 2x, 3x, 5x, or half x, it will print it. And so really, you don't need 1.6 millimeter standard PCB thickness anymore. You can do 0.8, you can do 2.2, whatever you want. Different layers can be different thicknesses. We can even talk about different thicknesses within layers in a few slides. So where do we fit? Or where does additive for electronics fit? Anywhere you want. You can plug us in way, way, way early in the idea, right? So we have a lot of our systems in innovation labs, right? When they're not burdened by a product, they have an idea. Is it patentable? Is it not? We got to test it out. Or some advanced R&D work, right? We want to go to management and have them give us money to develop this. We got to show them something. So we don't care about manufacturability. We just want to get something working to get funding. So option one. Option two, plug it into your conventional product design, maintain all the manufacturability rules, and just have a fast, rapid prototype system until your release candidate, right? Release candidate usually you want to do as it's being manufactured. So the release candidate would go to your favorite vendor. Anywhere you want. We don't care what tools you use, right? I know anybody here from Siemens? Great. Love you guys, but we love everybody else as well. We don't care. We're completely compatible with all design tools out there. From the free KiCad all the way to Expedition, whatever you want, we're good with it. We use uh, Gerber's or we use uh, uh, DXF files. We'll talk about these in a minute. What we actually do, we take the Gerber's, right? We translate from flat to 3D, right? So we pixelize and we build the geometries with pixels. That's really all it does. And so the user or the operator, by the way, in our office, our operator is our office manager. She's awesome. She loves our system, but she's never played with anything like it before. So definitely don't need to be, like I said, an expert in anything. Definitely don't need to be an engineer. Simply take the Gerbers. The system will identify by names. This is layer one. This is layer two. This is layer three. And decide what thicknesses you want. Click go. Done. Five minutes. No need to panel. I hate paneling. Hate it because I don't know what vendor I want. They're 24 inch panel, they're 18. I really don't want to deal with it until the very last step of actually building it for manufacturing. So one up and this will, this will panel for you, already broken out, right? It will print as many as it can on the, on the plate, whatever you want. Because I knew there was going to be somebody from Siemens here, right? So I, a I, little, little fun favorite, right? So. I believe this is from NX. Um, you can take any 3D design you want, SolidWorks, or if you're a Siemens customer, right, whatever you want, make a mechanical piece, give it electrical function. I have with me here, if somebody wants to see it, a bracket that has two connectors in it and an entire electrical harness into the bracket. As mentioned, no post-process, it comes off the print, right? There's a sacrificial print substrate that you just peel off. Here, you see it better. So the way we do uh, end of print post-process in the system is we heat it up and rapidly cool it down and that breaks our print from the substrate. And then you can just pick up the part and you're good to go. Things that... Uh, you may want to play with as different shapes. These are all 2D still. We haven't gotten to the 3D, and that's why I'm kind of talking a little bit faster. I hope I'm good in time. We'll get to the 3D in just a minute. But any sort of cutout, right, things, we really don't care what the shape is. In terms of layers, usually that's a very, very uh, interesting question. How many layers? Also, we don't care. I have a 80 layer board with me and I have a 20 layer board with me. We don't care. This is a funny story. Anybody from NVIDIA here? Cool. So this is an interesting story we had in 2017, right at the hype of cryptocurrency. This is a fix for a crypto miner that has 16 NVIDIA GPUs on it. And the designer forgot the 2.5 volt um, power supply for the DRAM and the thing wouldn't power up, right? After assembly, everything's done, just didn't power up. So once they figured what they forgot, 
They just wanted a little patch board just so they could not re-spin it and just get it to work. So tiny, tiny, tiny little LDO, right, power supply, printed out something with connecting five wires into the board, a $16,000 board, woke up and is ready to go, right? One day fix. More interesting things, but they're still flat. I want to skip those. Anybody in the RF realm? Okay, cool. So this is a design based of a, a sorry? This is based off, this is made by Harris Aerospace in Florida, if you guys don't know it, the microsatellite division. Uh, this is a transmission line. What they wanted to see is can they do off-the-shelf comparison one-to-one uh, -one versus something they made. So designed it, print it, no optimization of any kind of the materials, the process, anything versus whatever they made conventionally. This is meant to work at 2.4 and 5 gigs. So you can see, so um, green is 3D printed, red is conventionally made, and you can see a 2.4-ish lines kind of converge, also 5 and 2.4, and 5 is somewhere here, I believe. 0.1 dB difference. We've actually done a second experiment, which they can't release because now it's for their own parts, optimizing the materials and optimizing our process, and we actually beat the conventional by 10%. Then we asked them to do something, right? No, no, not a lot of people relate to transmission designed for microsatellites. We told them, hey, can we do something everybody can relate to? So if you can't fall asleep, read this. This is a, the publication, how to make drone antennas, right? All the DJIs, all the commercial drones use this type of uh, antenna in their uh, both uh, video and uh, the te uh, telemetry. So we designed this antenna um, and printed it one-to-one -one, and they made one. And again, performance spot on because it's a 2.4 gig. Uh, we did this a year and a half ago when we didn't know that we could do high speed that well. Now we're doing 58 gig antennas. And if you ever go to Harris in Florida and Melbourne, their customer experience, there's a lot of devices connected with these antennas in their experience center. Very cool stuff. To make this, to make six of those, eight hours, six dollars each. Trivial. Once we're done with printing, what do we do, right? The, the question is, or the answer is, everything you used to do. If you want to hand stuff components, great. If you want to reflow components, great. Whatever you want. Slightly variations, mainly in temperature. Uh, silver picks up solder paste really quick. There's no need to heat the pads, you know, preheat the board. None of those things are needed. It picks up very well. And thanks to Intel and Alpha materials, uh, there's even tin bismuth uh, reflow. Um, paste that it work at lower temperature for BGAs. Now where we get a little interesting. So this we all know, right? This is a breakout of a BGA. My dad did this 50 years ago. I did this 10 years ago and we still do it. Anybody seen ever a BGA breakout like this? So it, to, Yesterday, yesterday morning, um, Airbus in Germany released their uh, paper and, and, and information about everything they did with our technology, and they have a board that's done like that. And now again, I'm gonna pick up on the, uh, I'm gonna annoy the Siemens guy, because he's here. If there was an Altium person, I would say the same, but this is very easy to make now but you can't design it, and you definitely can't simulate it, right? If you wanna do signal integrity on this, there's no tools, but this is trivial. To, this is a lot faster and easier to actually build than this guy. And so we're working with all these software vendors, and you know we showed them this, and now we have a big player that actually makes these, right, like Airbus, and that's what they want. They want a tool that can design this and simulate this. So now the manufacturing tools are light years ahead of the software that's used to design it. 
things that are, you know, geometries, shapes, angles, things that mechanical engineers love and us EEs are, are fearful, right? What is this curve? How do I get around it? I don't like 90 degree turns, things like that. They're now super easy. This is now an old picture I have with me. Uh, I do know there's somebody in the room that uh, works at a company that makes a very popular cell phone, but most of us don't. And so when you make a cell phone, right, it's very well known that you put the CPU and the RAM and stack them together. That's a very costly process and there's a whole team of signal integrity people that test out the connection and it's expensive and only big, big, big companies do it. I have with me a PCB that has three stacked ICs and it's trivial to make. Any one of you can do the signal integrity and it costs nothing. So the way it does is there's just cavities in the PCB to make room for uh, different ICs at different levels and we can stack them one on top of the other. And then we can still use heat sinks and all these cool stuff. So if you wanna see it, I have it with me. Really cool, and you can take pictures of it as well. So again, things that are starting to take shape, cavity or raised surfaces, we don't care. We'll talk about this little guy here, right? We're gonna talk about components. Again, uh, you know, Apple has a new iPhone. None of the tier two size companies can get passive components in their supply chain, right? Apple orders all of them months ahead of time to build iPhones and iPads. And small companies, they're like, yep, no, no uh, 0204 components available, right? Six, 12, 16 weeks, whatever. So we can now print components. And to illustrate that, I wish I could say the name of the company that helped us, but all of you buy their capacitors. So these are printed capacitors. There's 20 layers of plates here, right? So separated inside the board, different sizes. There's, there's traces on top and on the bottom, right? So you can assemble components on top and the bottom. They're definitely bigger than the component size if this was an actual component, but I'm taking inner space, which usually you can't use, and I'm giving you surface space, which a lot of times is something you really want. And since this is part of the board, it doesn't care what the heat is, it doesn't care. It will never swell. It will last a very long time. So MTBF-wise, it's great. Go ahead. The question was, do we have a library of parts, how to achieve different capacitors? Anybody here from Texas Instruments? Morada? Okay. So yes, we do, but uh, we have, I don't know, a thousand values. There's, there's probably three million values. We're, the, we're working, again, with different vendor, software vendors for a plugin that will give you that, but a lot of the, uh, a lot of the values are yet, not yet defined in a in a library, it's something you have to design, but a lot of those we, we already have. Okay, so more 3D stuff, right? So here's the pictures from the bracket. I actually have the bracket. Uh, this is a test tool, a fixture, kind of like a crash test dummy. Uh, so again, my experience is defense. You build a prototype, it has to go to a vibration table, has to go to drop test, it has to go simulate a truck, simulate a uh, tracked vehicle, simulate an airplane, box, all those crazy things in the mill spec. And every time we would do this, it's annoying to start getting the cables from the uh, sensors to get, route them in the enclosure and find a way to route them out. Usually we would cut out a connector that's not needed for the test and route all the cables through it. But this is simple to do. So this is a piece of bracket that has a trace in it and that trace is meant to break at a certain impact. The bracket's not gonna break, the trace in it is gonna break. And so you can design this in any shape you want, stick it in your enclosure, wherever you think you have a problem, and do whatever testing you want, no external sensors, get the box back, test it out, did it break or did it not break? Simulation, designing this, 20 minutes, simulating this in SolidWorks or any FEA um, uh, software, five minutes and you're good to go. Also, 
My famous story, we designed something for general dynamics. We sent it out for field testing. It came back all busted, literally like a tank rank over it and then backed up just to make sure that it's broken. And we asked him, he said, okay, it's broken, fine, but tell us how so we know is this something we have to be worried about, redesign or fluke? And they're like, no data point. We don't know. Too many people involved, this is a, a side piece, didn't check, didn't know. This is how, you know, good luck to you. So especially in field tests, right, if you have a few of these, you will know what happened to your product. And if you run a, you know, simple GPI open that you have available, if you run current through it, if there's smaller impacts, this will change resistivity with smaller impacts and you can log these impacts in your product should you want to. We have some companies use this as a warranty strip, right? Your thing fell, it broke, right? Exceeded the G-forces, warranty declined. So here's the three stack up board. I actually have it. So what is this? Anybody work medical? Cool. This is a pacemaker calibration device. Today, if you have a pacemaker, anything is wrong with it, you're in the ER. First thing. And then they call your cardiologist. He's the only one that can interface with your device. This is shipped to you in the mail. When you're feeling anything, you plug in the battery, right? There's a strip. You pull out the strip. The battery connects. You place it on your heart, right, on your chest. No, you don't have to cut yourself anything. You place it on your chest, 15 seconds. It records whatever you want it to record. You put it in the envelope and you send it to the company. That's it. They take the data out and they throw it away, right? It touched a human, can't touch another human, throw it away. Next generation of this is actually gonna be connected to an app, right? So they wanna skip the shipping back. You're gonna use it, it's gonna log whatever needs to log, transmit it to your phone or whatever other device they're thinking about and send them the info. And then it will tell you, hey, go to the ER, normal, or whatever it needs to do. Extremely simple, uh, highly integrated, right? You can see the RF circuitry is built in. All the electronics are built in. Super simple, tiny, tiny, tiny little piece. Stackable, this is a hearing aid, right? So this is, goes into the ear, that's the uh, voice canal. So analog audio goes into an amplifier, goes up. Second stage is the DSP. Third stage is uh, like the general CPU that does other things and connectivity and things like that. All highly integrated, right, stackable, and they're not a cell phone company. Uh, a different version of that, right, you can see small IC, bigger IC, bigger IC. Some of the future things we're working on, uh, we're almost at the end, so I think I'm good on time. Um, almost at the end, right, so different materials we're working on. You wanna give you the Rogers performance, we wanna give you flexibility, we wanna give you higher performance and lower cost, right, things like that. Definitely wanna do, we're working with some of the uh, integrators or assembly companies, right, do we wanna do an inline assembly process? Maybe you wanna integrate a pick and place machine in it and the reflow since we already have a heating element in it. On the design side, right, non-planar design, definitely simulation, is it something we have to do or finally the big players in the field will actually do it. For security wise, we wanna do traceability, right? We wanna embed certain things in the print that you can then trace back to when this was made, what type of ink, when, what machine, all of these, right, for medical companies uh, to track. We want to do capture unique settings that you may have used in your system. Our system comes completely unlocked. All the knobs and switches, whatever you want. You want to turn up the heat, you want to turn down the heat, you want to turn up the UV. Whatever systems you, you want to change the uh, pass speed, you want to change the, the jetting volume, everything unlocked. If you happen to develop a unique skill or unique ability out of our system and you want to capture it, we want to give you an ability to capture it. And then you're, you're using our tool, your IP, we don't need to know about it, and then that will be yours. One last thing. Manufacturing is everything to us, right? 
I'm talking about prototyping because that's legitimately where we are and we don't have enough data to tell you, hey, this would work 20 years. But that doesn't mean we're not taking steps to do it. So a little uh, upgrade that came out just two months ago uh, took a step further into that, right, to do it a hands-off system, right, to further say, click a button, walk away. Increasing the print capability, right, we're printing faster uh, and we're adding uh, some of the defense and medical companies are bound by their rules. For us, for instance, the idea you need to print a coupon next to your print to be, in order to test it is, is just, it's just unnecessary because of the speed and because of the ability, you can actually print a single layer, right? If you think you have a problem between layer two and three, you can just print layer two and three and actually touch pads between layers. And so coupon means nothing, but they're bound by rules, so we added every print you make prints a coupon. And uh, we've added more sensors in the system to capture environmental, right, to help diagnose if something is not working right, then we want, to, we want to know all the data about it. That's all I had.